Team Fortress 2, that old chestnut of a game, has been around about for 10 years now. 10 years of rocket launches, cartoony deaths, varied maps, source filmmaker shorts and hats. Oh, so many hats. And with a game that has that kind of legacy, those 10 years of manpower put the game into the state and made what it is today, and with TF2 never leaving the top 10 of Steam's most played games, you'd think Valve would spend more time on it, right? Well, let's talk about that. It's nice to think and joke that Valve runs on Valve time, because they have a memetic status for being late with updates and such, in case you haven't noticed the Half-Life 3 memes going around for the past, like, 8 years or so. That expression devolved from being a ha-ha funny meme to just being outright insulting to Valve's player base, or part of it at least. I'm talking specifically about the TF2 player base today, but I'm very aware a lot of other people have covered the same ground I'm about to tread on, and I'm aware other fan bases in Valve's games have similar feelings. Feelings. Anywho, throughout the time that TF2 has remained dormant in the major updates department, I've filled the void with a lot of games that have vested my interest. To name a few, I started and stopped playing Paladins in early September 2016. I got sucked into the ugh, world of assassination with Hitman 2016, no subtitle, whatever the hell they want to call it, and I played a hell of a lot more Payday 2 to fill up a Captain Valve's seeming unwillingness to update one of its most popular games on its platform. Throughout the entirety of 2016, TF2 had general bug fixes and and three different cosmetic cases, and I'm not kidding when I say that's pretty much it. The last major update to TF2 was the Meet Your Match updates, launching back in July 2016 to... well... It was a travesty. Meet Your Match was in such bad shape when it launched that it was hated by absolutely everybody. The lobby screen was completely copy and pasted from the Man vs Machine lobby screen when the update launched. The entire server system was completely overrun with everyone having long wait times. Casual matchmaking removed ad hoc connections. You couldn't map multitask while queuing for a game like you can in CSGO, Overwatch, Paladins, and any number of AAA games. Competitive matchmaking, which by the way, was the entire sodding point of this update update was a complete joke. Not only was it completely broken, and it still is, the update competitive to include Turbine at one point during the silent stint. Frickin' Turbine! The CTF map that encourages engineers to build in the intel room, a haven for snipers and solid wars, a confined map that basically secures victory if you're running a medic and sticky bomb demo man combo, and that list is not exhaustive by the way. So after a long time, the Jungle Inferno update Finally released after 466 days. Think about that. 466 days. That is an incredibly long amount of time to keep your audience waiting, Val. Do you know how long that is? I'll do the maths for you. 66 weeks and 4 days. That's the longest wait of my life for any major update to a video game that I have any interest in. It was 348 days into that stint of silence that we got any semblance of communication for TF2. The communication in question was balance changes that were going to be a part of the Pyro update which were subsequently put into the game with a few tweaks. I won't go into the specifics here, the TF2 blog has the nitty gritty details if you're interested, but to give a little bit of a rundown, the ambassador getting a nerf because it was being used way too much as a pocket sniper apparently, too much for Valve's liking. The Sandman no longer stuns enemies when hit with the baseball, it just slows the person down so you can still so you can still defend yourself, and the Rescue Ranger was to have us long sought after nerf. The weapon is now deeply integrated and tied into the metal economy of the Engineer, with bolts requiring metal to heal a sentry from afar, which I will admit, as an Engineer main, that's probably for the best. It was really overpowered. That's besides the point. What Valve needs is a serious look at how it maintains its games. I don't find it fair, and call me entitled all you want, that TF2 has, and this is likely to change, 13 people working on it, while Dota 2 and CSGO all have over 20 people, according to reports that I've come across. Out of those 13 people, 3 of those people are actually coders, developers, and people maintaining the game itself. The rest of those people are artists, storyboards, which are just as important, but not so much when you're actually trying to maintain the game to a sizable audience. It's not surprising, then, that with so few people working on the game, Game, the updates are far and few between. I mean, is it any wonder at this point that the devs of TF2 took this long to push an update? A partial reason for all this hoo-ha is because Valve has the worst possible corporate structure possible, which is 
well, to work on what you feel like and to ham everything else. What that means is that Valve's current business structure is that employees work on the games that they want to and just not do anything else. So games like TF2 and the Half-Life franchise or the HTC Vive may not get any updates for a particular day and are left out in the cold, so the devs instead might want to work on the Oculus Rift, CSGO and upgrading the repository for SteamOS, one can dream, right? Meaning nobody's working on the games that are mentioned. My suggestion is obviously a pretty simple one, get more people working on TF2! Like, this isn't hard, and if you must keep this bizarre corporate structure of working on what you feel like, then at the very least hire more people to make up the numbers, so at least one person is working on TF2 all the time, is that so much to ask? Why am I suggesting stuff that could quite easily be done? I know it's feasible, as Valve has more money than I could dream of having in a lifetime sitting in a bank account, very likely offshore, somewhere in the world. And I am very aware that people like to think that Valve is cute for being unorthodox in its game development, and hey, maybe it works for them, and it has a mimetic status of being late to updates and stuff, but that does not excuse their decision to work under this business structure of work on what you feel like and, well, bugger everything else. There's a reason why other companies assign developers on specific projects, because it's bloody efficient, and, you know, generally better for everyone involved. The audience gets what they want, a game that is updated often, the devs get to work on a game they apparently love working on, and Valve makes money either way. It ain't hard, but like with Steam Greenlight and Steam Direct, which by the way are both travesties, Valve are just too lazy to give the actual manpower needed for a game or service to succeed, hence why Steam Greenlight and Steam Direct are travesties. And you know what the worst part is? I still like playing TF2. Sure, I've played it less in 2017 than I've ever done for the past couple of years, but I still like playing it as it's still a fun game to play. But waiting for that long, waiting for 466 days for a major sodding update, for balance changes, for things that just need to happen, for Pyro to be bloody fixed, it's not fun. It just isn't. It's just insulting at this point. <sighs> so, after the 466 days of waiting, was the Jungle Inferno update worth the wait? No, absolutely not. The content received was, and this is my opinion here, disproportionately small to the time taken to make it, and I'm not counting Christmas or Halloween here, I'm talking Jungle Inferno. Now, don't get me wrong, the massive patch that was released wasn't hugely bad in terms of content, and it didn't suffer from the same problems as the Meet Your Match update. Valve actually got off their arse and fixed game-breaking issues like the Delocos Bar exploit within a few days of it being discovered. I don't have any footage because that's how quick they were. So it seems that being active can only happen once in a blue moon, apparently. I like the new contract system that they've put in place now, which has a better laid out PDA display to manage which contracts you'd like to do. The concept of war paint is actually a genuinely good idea, and I'd actually like to see this in CSGO and various other things, and I'm very glad that these replace skins from now on. I'm not sure how paints can have wear to them, but hey, you gotta have artificial scarcity somehow, am I right? The new maps are all right, very well made, none of them are particularly bad, with exceptions being Banana Bay and Mercenary Park. Mercenary Park is just corridor after corridor after sodding corridor of pain. Banana Bay has the problem of being laid out like a Swiss cheese island or something. Floors overlap, there's underwater sections both payloads have to go through and bridges go underneath each other. On the plus side, Banana Bay does look rather pretty, which is something going for it, and I'd still play it over Hightower because at least play people are actually playing the objective. Lazarus is probably my favourite map of the bunch if I had to pick one. It's well laid out, has various flank routes to get to the point, it's King of Hill nature makes it frantic fun to play, and has a very nice jungly explorer aesthetic. The new weapons are, again, alright. The Dragon's Fury is surprisingly balanced as long as not every pyro on a given team is using the damn thing, requires the pyro to actually aim for once. The Gas Passer is situational at best and borderline useless at worst. It's a slower to recharge version of the Gerati, which acts like a cloud of gas that enemies pass through, hence the name Gas Passer, and then you get guaranteed critical hits on that enemy for a few seconds, including Pyro. Sounds good, except it has a frustratingly slow recharge time at the start of the round, which kills all use I would have had for it. It is slower recharging than the frickin' Gerati, the equivalent weapon for the sniper for crying out loud.
on the other end of the how good is this weapon spectrum, the thermal thruster is so much fun to jump about in, and I am never taking anything else from now on for my secondary slot on Pyro. This is a two charge jetpack that deals full damage on the enemy, yes please, and allows you to blast away to a short distance a la rocket or sticky jumping. Think Junkrat's trip mine, but on drugs. The heavy, despite this being ostensibly a Pyro themed update, got a new food item as a consolation prize, the second banana, which acts like a middle ground for the Delocus bar and the sandwich in terms of the healing done. The second banana has half the recharge time of the heavy and only heals for 200 health, which sounds like a nerf until you realize its true purpose. It's useful for giving health out to people, and if you're being pocketed by a medic, you can just throw a banana their way to store their health. Hell, the contract to get the item encourages this, and it's actually one of the easier contracts to get done. Speaking of contracts, oh boy, these are a mixed bag. Some of the optional objectives are a nightmare to complete. The most egregious optional objectives I've come across so far is defend .15 times and get a melee crit twice with the gunslinger. The first of which is confusingly worded as it actually means cap the point, then kill anyone on the payload team who's on the point itself. Not near it, on the damn point. This also applies to payload too, but at least easier to manage as, as people have to constantly push. Running sticky bomb demo is advised for that one. The second option objective that I've mentioned requires you to hit the same enemy three times in melee as an engineer using the gunslinger. The gunslinger, for some incredibly bizarre reason, doesn't follow standard melee crit rules of the more you swing, the better the chance of getting a crit. Instead, you have to hit your enemy three times successfully in order for the third punter to get a guaranteed critical hit. Please, for the love of Gaben, change this TF team, because this makes no goddamn sense as to why this is a mechanic specific to the gunslinger of all things. The only way of succeeding is by vastly exaggerating which game mode you play, which is to say, go on medieval mode and hope for the best. That contract took for me five separate games to complete, not five rounds, five games. So clearly contracts need a lot of work then. Apart from those two, it's class specific stuff, kill Solly with the black box, heal his medic, destroy sentries, etc. The difficulty of them scales quite nicely. Halloween mode was exactly the same as last year, just with a different PDA. No point going into it really. Cosmetics are cosmetic, they're there if you want them, so I won't go into much detail again, but I do like Hales' own hat, which you can get from the contract system, and the Yeti attire, which again you can get from the contract system. Also, I unboxed a strange Karibu companion, and I'm aware that wasn't a cosmetic from the Jungle Inferno, but shut up, Jimmy's bragging, and that's as close as to an unusual I'm ever gonna get, I'd imagine. Oh, and we had a 5 minute SFM short that did the hail shouty thing. Yeah, that was rather funny actually. Jimmy! But before I sign off, I want to remind all of you of that number again. 466 days. I will never forget that number, because that number represents a period of time of neglect from Valve, a neglect of information, a neglect of the player base, and a crossing of a line of my patience that does not have an easy form of retribution. And with that, I thank you very much for listening. I don't like being angry, but I can be angry. Mr. Angry.